Right then, those of you who watch my other channel, the Pond Guru channel, will probably remember that under here we had a massive filter system. And I've taken it out because it was at the wrong side of the pond, it was an absolute bummer to clean, and I wasn't making any use of any of the water. And it has been moved over there, behind those bushes, for a specific purpose. So let's go and take a look. And while we're on our way over there, I might as well just explain that these are the platforms that I put in last year. We've got big two foot brushes hanging off the bottom of crates which are filled with alpha grog and then they've been planted up. So those plants, on the whole, are coming through pretty well. Not so well on this one, but certainly very well on that one. So you can imagine that extending about three feet under the water. The amount of fish that it attracts, they just love to use it as a habitat there, you know. I actually had Colin that works for me um, fishing the other day and just off the end of here he caught some absolutely magnificent perch. I mean they were not specimen fish but they were absolute belters, you know. Really good fish. Tell you what, before we go around there I'll just chuck a few pellets in. Absolutely all sorts of fish in there. Most of those will be rud. There's a few golden off. Um, might even be the occasional trout still kicking about in here. Uh, roach as well. Mo mostly coarse fish, but uh, just in absolutely beautiful condition. Really healthy. Now the pump that supplies these filters is a beast. 56,000 litres per hour. It's a high... God, what is it? Hydea? Hylia? Hylia pump? It's basically a big Chinese thing. I'll put a link to it in the video description. I think it's a Hylia... Ooh, something like a D60,000. Something like that. But it actually produces 56,000 litres an hour, which is far too much for the filter. So I've teed it off. Put it off how you that. That one there goes to a shower filter and that one there just spits straight back into the pond and that's got a venturi on it, that's where you can hear it going suck an air in. It just helps to shift the water around in the pond. And that's the one that feeds up to the little shower filter. At some point I may reinstate the big um, uh, stainless steel shower filter but I'm not sure. I might not. There's certainly enough water to supply another filter, if necessary. So, I'm going to excuse a little bit of mess, but I left this here just so you could see what was in these various tanks. We've got loads of crates of grog, biohome, uh, pumice, a bit of all sorts in, really. And these troughs are about half filled with that, so in the back two-thirds it's all filter media. So the water's pumped up from the pond, it goes into this vortex, swirls around, drops down into this one, swirls around, drops into this one, swirls around, then it goes into here, swirls around, gets settled out in amongst a load of brushes and uh, crates of grog and everything. And then it goes into this next section, again, same things happen, that one, same things happen, that one, same things happen. At some point I'll probably cut circular holes out of here and put big plants in here, so the roots go down into the water and that will provide an unbelievable habitat for all sorts of invertebrates, which in turn will wash out of the exits and go in and feed the fish. So those exits travel down here and the water's just spat out in various directions through the two inch pipes. Because it draws air in at the filter side and mixes it as it's flown down here it 
creates a really aerated stream of water and the fish really seem to love it. You often get like shoals of fish congregating around that outlet. So all of these various parts of this big filter have drain outlets on the bottom there. As you can see, all those ones are closed off, except, uh, which one? Yeah, we're doing this one. The second um, vortex. Last week, it was the first vortex that I was draining. This week, it's that one. Next week, it'll be that one. And all these pipes feed into a common pipe, which go all the way down there into my vegetable garden and probably about a hundred yards further on to my other vegetable garden. So really this currently is providing quite a lot of settlement. You know, there's very little suspended sediment in the big pond. Obviously it's green because there's no UV on here and on a sunny day it gets full sun for most of the day. Uh, that makes it go green. There's no way of getting around that. I do have a big UV unit. I can't really see the point in fitting it though because it won't be big enough. It's not going to keep that from going green. I, ideally I should have got a couple of bales of barley straw, put them in at the top where the spring comes in and never got round to doing it. The fish don't mind it being green. It's all part of nature really because the, the greenness feeds loads of little microorganisms which in turn feed the macroorganisms, fish and so on and then if we ever need them they'll feed us so it really is a self-sustaining system in that pond this just helps and it also helps to supply water to my vegetable gardens which you'll see in an upcoming video i'll probably do an update on this if and when i get the holes cut in the mesh on the top and put big plants in with the roots hanging out that really will provide Oh God, abundance as far as invertebrates go. The, the roots will just be swarming with things. Uh, yeah, I, it's got to be done at some point. It's just not high up on my list of priorities yet. Probably towards the end of the year, I will do that though. So this is working very well. The pump is a beast. It's shifting plenty of water. The water's nicely aerated. It's moving around fish are really happy and responding well. When Colin fished the pond, honestly man, some of the fish he was catching were just belters. Really the next time Colin fishes the pond, I'll probably fish it myself as well or I'll hang around with him for an hour or so and I'll video some of the fish that come out of that pond because they're absolute belters. I mean they're really, really healthy. As a system, it's working very, very well. Thanks for watching, join me in part two of this series because we'll be taking a look at the off-grid solar system. Okay, welcome to part two. In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at the off-grid solar system. This is, <laughs> oh, is it 12.4, 12.6 or 12.8? I think it's 12.4 kilowatt solar system. There's 38 panels, you can see them behind me here, and each one generates up to 320 watts. So you can do the maths on that one. I think it's 12.4 kilowatts in total. Now this is a ground mounted system because it is mounted on the ground. We were gonna go with panels on the bank side behind me, but we would have had to build all sorts of framework, possibly put up like some sort of scaffolding and mount them to that. This behind me used to be the remnants of a wood with overgrown, pretty knackered trees that really just destroyed our view, so we took them down. That wasn't my first option. I did want to keep them um, because we've got, a we've got fields out the back of my place. There's one of them. It's got gorse bushes, um, also known as whinny bushes, and I actually ask the farmer if I could buy that small piece of land to put the solar system on so that I didn't have to chop this wood down but he wouldn't have it so we chopped the wood down I've now got about three years worth of firewood which is awesome we've now got a really nice view from the house 
which I'll show you now. Now that's a pretty bloody good view to wake up to. And I'm glad that I couldn't buy that piece of land out the back of my place because I couldn't live without that view now. You know, I, I cannot understand how I've lived here for over 20 years without having that sort of vista. It's really strange, but you don't kind of realize what you've never had if you've never had it, you know? Anyway, enough of that. Going back to this, all of these panels are linked together. They all feed back to a common armored cable which then feeds up to my small shed and that's where we've got the batteries. Now they are two lots of 5.8 kilowatt batteries. So there's two times 5.8, that's 11.6 kilowatts of storage. Towards the back end of the year, I might actually get another one of those because I want to go fully off grid if I can. I really don't want to be relying on any sort of external power company Right, this is what a ground mounted system consists of. It's basically got uh, like a preformed base here, which is angled. I think it's 20 degrees or 22 degrees to get the right angle for the sun or something like that. Inside of there, it's hollow. So there's a couple of bags of sand or gravel or something going there just to hold it down, just to weigh it down. And then the big panels just clip in and bolt into there. As I said, these are all linked up and they feed through conduit. So, you know, each one of these feeds across here. We've got conduits going across there. They all feed back to a cable which runs behind this little raised wall um, along here and up into my shed, which is where we'll go now. And when we're on our way over there, I will say that we obviously had a digger in to create these terraces. I think we brought about 200 tons of stuff in, which was mostly like heavy clay, you know, just basically subsoil and all that sort of crap. And we had the big digger doing this during the winter and it sunk and there was a massive pile of stuff in here that still needed to be shifted. So I actually did that by hand and it was a hell of a job. It was maybe 25, 30 ton shift by hand and I shaped all of this by hand so you know all of this has been basically built up one shovel full at a time. It was a bit of a task. I just did it on a night after work but it enabled me to get this in early season and the ground has settled. It's rock hard underneath there. It's made a really good base for these panels. We can't even see them from the house and they do a cracking job. Unfortunately, my cats paddle all over here. Birds have been crapping on it, but they're really easy to clean. Although, having said that, I haven't cleaned them yet. They are in a really easy place to clean. And we've got a power outlet here. We've got mains water up here, so we could bring a jet wash down if necessary. I don't think it'll need a jet wash though. Just a wet rag will do. So they'll have to get cleaned at some point just reminded me there's actually two cables run from those um, panels because they're, they're effectively two separate systems there's 19 panels feeding into each cable so there's two cables run up and then they go into here in the shed where the batteries are all right so what we've got in here is two pretty big inverters so we've got one for the 19 panels, another one for the other 19 panels. Same with the batteries, although they are linked together. Now, one of the systems gives us instant power. The other one concentrates on charging the batteries. These batteries can be charged by, I don't know, half eight, nine o'clock in the morning, in the summer, on a sunny day. And that gives us the rest of the panels for instant power without draining the batteries. They've each got little heaters here, which obviously aren't on at the moment because we're in the summer. And that's basically the setup. So there will be another battery going in there, probably against that wall in the back end of the year, because I do think we need a little bit more storage. 
and we'll have to check the cost of them because the system ain't cheap. Now having the batteries charging and discharging all throughout the day means that they generate quite a lot of heat. So we've totally insulated the shed. That serves to keep the heat from outside out in the summer, but it also helps to keep the heat generated in here in in the winter and it stops the cold coming in and really those little heaters are just kind of like a backup thing they're really there just in case the temperature drops below as a five degrees or ten degrees below a certain level anyway because below that level the batteries don't work properly most people would have these in their houses but I didn't want any of this in my house because it takes up quite a lot of space we don't have this available space in our house whilst it might look pretty big from the outside it's not it's not actually very big there's a lot of wasted space in our house there's a lot of windows not many storage places hence i just cleared out the shed we insulated it put them in here and another reason they're in here is because they will give off quite an electrical field and i don't want to sleep in an electrical field I actually turn off the Wi-Fi and as much of the electrical stuff as I can every night and I find that helps me sleep better. If I was sleeping within feet of all these things, I probably wouldn't get much sleep at all. So the shed is the best place for them. The whole system was installed by a company which was local, which again is important to me. I want to support local business. That company was called Sustainable Energy not solutions, sustainable energy engineering and they're from Washington which is probably about 20-25 minutes south east of my place I'll put the link to them in the video description they're a family business again it's important for me to support local family business and they did a cracking job really nice group of people and when I you know suggested putting an extra feed out with like it would allow me to run you know heavy stuff from it it wasn't a problem they ran it out i wanted sockets here i wanted there. just various things shifted about obviously there was a cost involved in that not a problem to me and not a problem to them i'm very very happy with this system it's working very well if i want to check how well it's working i can just go on to the solar x website i can just check that everything's working okay see how charged the batteries are and keep an eye on my consumption um, and that's like from the batteries or from the grid and what I found is that on a night if the hot tub comes on a few times it can sometimes stay on for an hour heating up and it's like three kilowatts or something that devours the battery so if we get another battery we could possibly well we should have power to see us right through the night even if the hot tub's coming on and off and on and off i've got the big pond pump on a timer so it's hardly on during the night i really want it on constantly during the day or more or less constantly when it's sunny or when it's bright or light so it's costing me basically nothing to run and the idea is that electricity will cost us nothing that is my goal obviously to get all this in is a canny bit of money it I won't even tell you the cost because the cost will obviously vary based on what you want and the situation you need to put it in but for me this already has been well worth it I'm very very pleased thanks for watching I shall see you in the next video when we'll be looking at vegetable garden number one Okay, welcome to part three of this series of what I have been doing in the garden in 2020. <laughs> this is vegetable garden number one. Some of this went in in 2019, most of it went in in the summer of 2020. So consequently, we've got a few of the older beds, which are like, you've got plants in that have overwintered. And that includes this mad patch of garlic, which are just absolutely massive. We've got a, a rogue walking onion and a few, um, oh God, what are they called, man? Raspberries with a few strawberries across the front. In this bed, which is approximately oh, eight foot, eight foot six square, we've got some Swiss chard, also known as rainbow chard. We've got black, uh, oh God, what's it called, man? Black, black radish, which is jet black. This net needs to come off now 
because these plants are actually starting to grow through it. Um, I just put that on just to stop the pigeons hammering it. In here we've got some late potatoes, tatoes, taties, tatties, and they're starting to come up really well. They're in a huge bed of horse muck, so I'm expecting a massive crop from them. All the way along the back of here we've got a mixture of Black currant bushes, red currant bushes, strawberries, oh god, there's, there's all sorts in there. It's just basic fruit to make like a fruit hedge there. In the next of the big beds, we've got some onions. They went in about three weeks ago, and they're already huge. I could probably take this net off now, but I just put it on there just to stop the cats digging it out, or pigeons pulling these out. I think they'll probably be pretty well rooted now. Yeah, they are. In here, we've got some reject show leeks. My friend Michael from a local um, nursery, which is Beverages, gave me these. He basically gets given them from folks who don't want them. They've basically got too many. So he gets the, the cast-offs and he gave me a big tree of those. They're really doing well. In fact, everything's doing really well down here. The, the ground is just so nutritious. It's all recycled compost. So everything's kind of, you know, <laughs> ecologically sound and <laughs> sustainable and in this last little triangular bed we've got more black currants um, blueberries pink blueberries there's all sorts in there more of them along there what are these ones more blueberries these two things are joster berries which is apparently a cross between oh what is it a black currant and a God, what is it, man? Black, black currant and a. How we? God, my memory's absolutely atrocious. Black currant and a gooseberry. So I'm expecting great things from them. Maybe it's not this year, but certainly next year. And if you're wondering what all these pipes are doing, blighting the landscape, these are part of my watering system. The smaller beds, i.e., this one and the garlic bed at the far end have a gate valve on which allows me just to lift that and quickly water this bed because this is really quite a long way away from where I store the water I also have two water butts here well water troughs each one's approximately two foot by three foot by about two foot deep I think they hold 150 liters each that's really handy just to dip a water and can into and they're really easy to fill up as well because if you notice they've got a valve on there I'll show you just how much water comes out as well um, I'll do it from this one first of all I'll show you this There we go. <laughs> That's watering for the lazy man. <laughs> and all that water's coming directly from the drains that are on the bottom of my filters, which are over this hilltop. So they're probably, oh, I don't know, 30 meters away maybe. Now these drains also run down here down the side of the lawn and they go down to my second vegetable garden which we'll be taking a look at in the next video. Oh, we're definitely not short of water. Now as well as what I've shown you there's also a nation of little fruit trees which have dotted around the place. There's a, a gooseberry hedge down here. It'll probably be really great next year. Has got quite a few on this year but um, next year is going to see it really fill out. And there's also a nation of other little fruit trees down here. Again it's going to be two or three years before they really do anything. The one thing I didn't show you is the little wild strawberries around the outside of the trough. Any of the overspilling water just gets taken up by the strawberries and hopefully they'll produce me a little crop of intense tasting wild strawberries. Now all these beds have been made with reclaimed railway sleepers and if you're watching this in 2021 and you want to replicate this you'd be lucky to get any. 
I planned this garden 2019. I got a lot of the sleepers 2019, picked up the rest early 2020. If you try and now in mid 2021, you'll have a hell of a job in the UK to get railway sleepers. You'll even have a hell of a job getting new so-called railway sleepers which are cut from softwood. All these are hardwood and it took, well it took three of us to get these big beds in. I put the smaller beds in myself. I, I called in help to get them finished off because these are so, so heavy. You, you literally can't lift one yourself unless you've got it close to you and you've got it in like a bear hug and then you can't do anything with it. You know, if you have one person at one end, one in the middle and one at the other end, it makes them much easier to handle. And I've really got to thank my brother, Peter, and my mate, Jimmy, for helping me to finish this off. I'm very pleased with it. Oh, it's just about to wrap up there. And I've just remembered I haven't shown you my invention. I like to make things easier. If I have a, a job or a task that I think, you know, this is a right fart on this. I wonder how I can make it easier. I just almost go into a trance. I see something, I build it in my mind and then I build it in real life. This thing I'm going to show you is such a thing. It's basically something that allows me to water heavily very quickly. Check this out. <laughs> All right, now we've got a gate valve here with a two inch outlet. It feeds into a pipe, flexible pipe, which feeds into this solvent pipe. And that's two inches, a 45 degree on there. There's a, oh, what do you call it, a hose tail with a clip on there to hold that in. So that feeds water into here. We've got a gate valve here to control the flow. We've got a handle. <laughs> and then we've got an end on there. You maybe just can't see it, but it's got loads of holes drilled in it. Let's get a bit closer, there you go. It almost looks like a howitzer barrel. And I'll show you just how effective this is by watering these leaks very quickly. Right, so what I would normally do is shut this gate valve to prevent any water coming out. I would open that valve to allow water to come into the pipe. And then I would pick this thing up and lift this valve to let the water out of the end. And you'll be pretty impressed when you see how much water comes out of here. Here we go. Come on. And remember, all of that is coming from the drains on the pond filters. Super nutritious water. And as I said, we can control the flow with a gate valve. That's more like it. There you go. What do you reckon of that? Now these raised beds behind me are all lined out on the inside with a uh, like a perm permeable, uh, not perforated, what would you call it? Like a landscape fabric, a woven landscape fabric, which goes about two thirds up the side and all the way along the bottom. That helps to retain the moisture a bit, stops any weeds coming up from the existing ground, and it probably stops a lot of slugs coming through from the sides or from the bottom, because they like to travel up through the soil if they can't climb over things. I don't know, don't seem to get a problem with the slugs here, which is good. So as far as sleepers go, there's probably, I don't know, 35, 40 big railway sleepers used to make this thing. Um, the, the landscape fabric, I'll put a link to in the video description. And the net that I've used here is a multi-season pond net or fruit cage net. I didn't want to go for the cheap crap because it just doesn't last. As soon as you had like one season of sun on it, it would just start to break. This is really good stuff. I think I bought 100 meters of it, which is far too much because it's six meters wide, but I wanted plenty 
for any future projects. So this is Veg Garden 1. The next video I'll show you Veg Garden 2 and that's the good one. Or should I say that's the better one. Because I think this one is pretty good. But that one is better. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello, welcome to part four of my what have I been doing in 2020 type of videos. This one, we're gonna be taking a look at veg garden number two. Before we get into it, I just wanna give a big shout out to Tony from the YouTube channel, Simplify Gardening. Tony is in Wales, really nice guy. As far as gardening experience goes, he has 40 years on me, 2020 was my first foray into any sort of fruit and veg growing, which is pretty tragic, considering that I am 40, 47, 48 now or something, knocking on for 50. Uh, I'm a long way behind Tony. If you want tips and tricks and good advice on how to grow things from an expert, and I will call him an expert, I don't call many people experts, he is an expert gardener, really knows what he's on about, I'll put a link to his channel in the video description. That's Tony from Simplify Gardening. This is the Veg Garden 2 video. I think it's part four of my what I've been doing in 2020 series. That's Veg Garden 1 up there. The pond filters are over the bank side there and we've got a pipe that runs all the way down here. It cuts down the side of the greenhouse, which I'll show you in the next um, part of the series. It runs under a path and it goes into Veg Garden 2, which is where we're heading off to now. This is a belter. I absolutely love being down here. <laughs> it's like an edible jungle. Check that out. This was just wasteland in 2019. In fact, until mid 2020, it was all just wasteland. I made these sleeper beds on a night. I just I made all this one myself. Um, it took me a while. A lot of hours have gone into it, but it's been well worth it. So, without further ado, uh, let me walk you around it. So, we've got steps going down into the garden here, and across the top of these gabion retainers we've got a herb garden so there's all sorts of herbs there a lot of them are flowering so they attract the bees which in turn fertilize a lot of the plants in the garden and we also use some of the herbs in the in the kitchen as well so uh, they are useful not just decoration so coming down here you'll see that i'm a big fan of container gardening and in here We've got some red ribbed dandelion, which apparently is a superfood. I haven't eaten much of this yet. It just really just tastes like a bit of lettuce. Yeah, it really just tastes like lettuce. These are lettuce in here. But these bits of weld mesh are just to stop pigeons from landing on the side of here and eating away at the lettuce. Here we've got purple kale across there it hasn't really developed its purple color or got its really compact leaves yet but it's getting there oh uh, what more kale there i've got four lots of kale now i don't eat much kale but my daughter does so when she comes back from university she's not going to be short of stuff to eat here we've got something i just potted up the other day which is apparently a kale brussels sprout hybrid so i'm interested to see what that comes up like here we've got something called amaranth, which is, uh, now is it a member of the spinach family? It's apparently a superfood. I just thought I'd grow it from seed, see what it comes up like, and see what it tastes like. And in this pot, we've got something called yakon, which is, uh, it's like a tuberous root vegetable. I think it's a South American plant. It's not, um, not, not fully hardy, so I had that one in the greenhouse and just brought it out. And apparently it gets pretty tall and gets big tuberous roots on which you can eat. Obviously I haven't tried that one yet. I'm looking forward to trying it though. Here in the same pot we've got some mustard. It tastes really, really hot and peppery. It tastes really good. 
Now here we've got something called, oh god, is it okra or ochre? It's basically New Zealand yam. It looks like giant clover leaves, but it's also another root vegetable. Like it gets tubers on, um, but basically little little yams, like a purpley red colour. And I got this off somebody in the Shetland Isles or the Orkney Isles, way off the top of Scotland. I think it was the Orkneys, and they were growing it outside. So if it's hardy enough for them up there, it's hardy enough for me here. But apparently this one, you need to bring the tubers in that you're going to grow next year in the back end of the year and overwinter them in a dry place because it's not fully frost hardy. Oh. Right, which way around are we going to go? We'll, we'll go this way around. All these are wild strawberries in here. We've got a strawberry raspberry hybrid living in here. Apparently it forms like a bush and it gets a little pom-pom balloon berry. That's it. Balloon berry. That's its common name. Or one of its common names. And it gets little little like pom-pom sort of raspberries on the top of the plant. It looks really interesting so I thought I'd give that a go. I planted some more in other parts of the garden as well. And above that in this bed we've got some overwintered onions. These are all white onions and from here onwards are all red onions. There's quite a lot of onions in there. Just as well we're getting a chest freezer. I'll just dice them up and put them in bags I think. I love onions. I absolutely love them. Here we've got some various sorts of like peppery salads and oriental stuff. Again, they just taste like peppery lettuce to me and they all just kind of taste the same but in a salad they are nice. Water butt, I think it's a five or six hundred litre water butt and I can almost empty this when I'm watering the plants in here using the big watering can. They take a lot of water because there's a lot of plants. And in a similar way to how we filled the water butt in the previous part, we just lift this, it fills the water butt from the filters which are about 100 yards away. So all this is young corn, fish crappy, really mature, silty water. Perfect for growing plants. As you can see, it's flanked by various types of strawberries. I love strawberries, so I've just planted them in every little nook and cranny. When we put the edge in on this path, I made sure that this edge was stepped off this bed about three inches, filled it with compost, planted it up with strawberries. I like to make use of every little square inch. So above that, in this bed, we've got potatoes. These are gonna be my first potato crop for this year. They are just gigantic. Again, the soil's really nutritious. I've been chucking horse muck in, they've had potato feed, they've been watered really well. They're doing well. And then here we took some leeks up recently. So in their place I've planted some celeriac in here. Two rows of them and a little row of corn, like sweet corn. I think there's only six plants. We'll give them a go, see what they do. They'll be ready later in the year. And off to the side of there we've got some peas. There's two big pots of peas. And as you can see, they're absolutely laden with peas. It amazes me how quickly those pods come out as well because it was only a few days ago that the flowers started appearing. Then the flowers went, for the most part, and the pods just seemed to drop out of where the flowers had been. And, oh man, there's got to be a nation of peas on there. I love peas. In fact, I like all the vegetables. And in this bed, we've got something called electric daisy which is also known as toothache plant. It gets like a daisy flower with like a, a yellow head and apparently it tastes really zingy, limey and it, it has almost like an electric shock sort of effect <laughs> when you put it on your tongue. So I'm really looking forward to trying that. That's, it's again, it's just something I grew from seed. Here we've got, oh, what the hell are they, honeyberry plants. They won't do anything this year, they're one for next year. Here we've got Logan berries, one, two, three or four Logan berries crawling up there. Uh, further along there we've got thornless blackberry. I think there's another blackberry one over the edge of here maybe. Something over there, it could be a Logan berry. And I think there's another blackberry one at the far end there as well. The idea being, oh there he is, that's a thornless blackberry. The idea being that'll grow up 
cover this trellis with fruit bearing plants. That's the plan anyway, we'll see how it goes. Here we've got various herbs, we've got caraway. Oh, uh, what's that one? Oh God, what's it called? Not mallow. I cannot remember. Just <laughs> my memory's bloody terrible. Various herbs. We've got a few little pillar fruit trees in here. They don't get very tall. They look like they're five foot, and they don't spread out either. So they're just, yeah, they're just to fill space. We've got some sage, honey berry, some apple. What else have we got? Two different sorts of fennel. We've got the common fennel. And we've got the bronze fennel, and it's just starting to go bronze now. That's a lovely aniseedy sort of a flavour. Really like fennel. And in here, you may notice there is a preformed pond. I'm going to build a blockwork wall up against here. Put the preformed pond in. Tap into my neighbour's downcomer, which will go into a water butt, which will be here. The overflow from that will go into the pond, I'll put like a rock work up and so on on the sides hopefully we'll have resident frogs, newts, toads, all that sort of thing to help me keep the garden free of pests okay moving on we've got what has already become a really <laughs> overgrown herb bed we've got thyme of various sorts, I think that's a common thyme smells lovely as well it's really nice. We've got various sorts of mint. So we've got like, you know, I think that's Moroccan mint, orange mint, lemon mint, garlic chives. Uh, I've even put tomatoes in here because I grew far too many tomatoes. They wouldn't all fit in the greenhouse. And I just thought, oh it, I'll stick them in the garden. This wall radiates heat on a night. So it helps to keep them nice and warm. Hopefully they'll produce something. Here we've got a nation of parsley, more thyme, this one's lemon thyme, this one smells the best. I mean, I wish I had smell o vision Yes, you oh, are. Oh, smell that. What do you reckon? Oh, beautiful. This one is called celery salad leaf. And believe it or not, these leaves taste so intensely of celery. You just take a few of those off, rip them up, put them in a salad, and you would swear that you had proper celery in your salad. More mint, that's pineapple mint. Oh, what's that one? Ginger mint. There's all sorts of mint in here. Very sickly looking bay tree. Now I, I got that for free because at the time I was going to buy it, the guy said, look, it probably isn't gonna live and it looks like it isn't gonna live. I've tried to nourish it, but uh, it's not looking good. Here we've got some strawberry towers and I made those out of black four inch pipe. It's difficult to see because it's so overgrown, but Let's have a look. Yeah, there you go. I've formed these little pockets. And you'll get a better view of, you know, how this pipe was made in a video I'm gonna put out very shortly because this is what I practiced on to get my hydroponic or aquaponic growing towers done. I used the black pipe just to practice on. I thought I might as well just save it. So I chopped it in half and now we've got some really healthy strawberries in there couldn't tell you what type they are but those ones in the bottom of here are giant strawberries apparently although they don't look as big as the normal ones I may have been sold a dud there but I did buy them on eBay <laughs> behind me we've got things that my mate Aiden gave to me we've got some walking onions instead of them getting onions on the bottom of the plant they get them on the top where the flower would normally be and you get like little crazy bunches of shallot type onions growing up here when this gets too heavy it flops over some of them take root wherever it lands and that forms the new plant which in turn walks to various places hence the name walking onion behind me we've got something called sunchoke which is a sort of artichoke I can't remember the name of it. So it, it is known as sunchoke, but it's also known as some other sort of artichoke, Jerusalem artichoke. 
they're known as like a prepper plant because you would just plant those out in your wood or out in your plot of land. You could form a hedge with them and they produce a nation of big tubers which you can eat. But apparently if you don't prepare them properly, they'll make you fart like a horse. So my goal will be not to prepare them properly and fart like a horse because that'll be funny. And beyond them, we've got something called skirret, which is like a, oh, it's classed as like a medieval root vegetable. It's a sort of like a parsnipy thing. It gets long, gnarly roots on. Apparently that was Henry VIII's favorite vegetable. He was a little bit like me in that he liked his food. So if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Further on than that, we've got some Chinese artichoke in here. They get little maggoty sort of growths on the bottom of the roots about this long. Really strange thing. Apparently, uh, they're like a delicacy, like a gourmet thing. You see them in really fancy restaurants. We've got four tubs of those. Again, Aiden gave me those. He also gave me the skirret. He likes to grow unusual stuff. Really nice guy, thanks very much Aiden. And behind there, we've got some, God, what is it? Tearberry, Loganberry, Thornless Blackberries. Yeah, there's all sorts in the back of there, going all the way along here. So what I've done is made almost like a sort of gibbet with paracord going through it. And my idea is that these will come up and wind the way down here and kind of hang over there so it'll give me a wall of fruit to pick from. Whether it pans out like that or not is anybody's guess, but I've gone to a lot of trouble to make that, so I hope it works. <laughs> In here, we've got various sorts of raspberries. I like raspberries. I just love fruit. I love vegetables. Love fruit. The vegans will be cursing themselves because I also love, love meat as well. I just love good food. In here, we've got potatoes. There's five big tubs of potatoes. They're doing really well. They're going to produce a nation of taties. In here, I've just planted some um, purple potatoes, not purple ones, like red skin potatoes. Uh, we did actually buy them to use in the house. They sat in the back of the cupboard. I forgot about them. They started to go to seed. And I thought, I'm not going to waste them. Let's get some pots, put them in there. Now they'll come up over the next month or so and they'll be ready for the back end of the year. Here we've got more raspberries, more peas. So we've got the first crop of peas there. Here we've got the second crop of peas, hopefully. These are purple podded peas. And these have the bonus of having a really beautiful flower on. So I'll be interested to see what they do. I just grew those ones from seed again. They're really tall, probably about five foot six tall already. So it's just as well I put a big wigwam up. Moving on, we've got a nation of wild strawberries. These are ones that we've just gathered when we've been out for a walk. Backs of hedgerows, up the mountains. They do really well and I mean, God, look at all the flowers on them. All of them are just gonna have like ruby red fruit on. Intense flavor as well. These are more of those balloon berries. I'm hoping to create just a shrubbery in here with fruit on the top. Yeah, that one's actually getting a flower on as well, as is that one. Good stuff. And behind them, we've got three finger lime or caviar lime trees. These might need a fleece over them in the winter. They're hardly down to minus five, but I've put them next to our septic tank, which is this thing, because that will generate heat in the winter. Hopefully that may keep this area a little bit warmer and also we've got the gabions here which take in all the heat during the day and radiate it on a night they might do pretty well there but again they're not going to do anything this year they're one for next year here we've got a bed of walking onions and potato onions and just various rare types of strange onions there they've been in since last year and already this one god it's massive it must be i bet it's probably four foot tall and bear in mind it's gonna have all its onions on the top of there it's gonna look really weird and then beyond them we've got 
rhubarb. I should know the name of that one. That's the one that Colin gave me. Thank you very much, Colin. He dug it out of his garden. I cannot remember the name of it. Um, we've got another one there, which again, I only put in there two or three weeks ago. I can't remember the name of that one either. Rhubarb is rhubarb as far as I'm concerned. It all tastes the same. <laughs> More tomato plants here. These are various types. I think there's Tigerella, Green Zebra, and San Mazzano, which is an Italian one. They might grow, they might not, but again, the near the Gabians, which will help to radiate the heat out for them. Different types of gooseberries. They're probably not going to do much this year because they were very small when they went in. And if we head back to the boards, this bed, you see more wild strawberries, more wild strawberries, broad beans, that's our purple potted peas. We've got some lettuce under there. I've literally just put those in so they're not very big. Although they are doing quite well. Yeah, they're looking healthy. They've come on really well since they went in and they're very well protected in there as well. And then in here we've got some pak choy. Again, they're starting to come away really well. We've already had a batch of pak choy out from underneath these covers. They did exceptionally well. I mean, they literally filled these tunnels and these are made from UV stabilized clear PVC it's an expensive way to make a cloche but it's gonna last for years you know I don't want to use cheap plastic and then just throw it away every year it seems like a bit of a waste you know and all I do if I want to get into here is just lift that up lift that up And we're in. And this blue pipe is just 19 or 20 mil water pipe. I bought a roll of that because we've piped mains water into the greenhouse. I had some left over, so I just came up with the idea of making these. We've got three hoops under the sheet two hoops over the sheet to secure it. Very simple, but it works really well. Okay, so that's veg garden number two. In the previous video, where I showed you the first veg garden, I did say that this one had most of the stuff in, and it's absolutely jam-packed with various sorts of plants. I love being down here. I absolutely love it, because previous to me building this, it was just wasteland. We used to just bring cardboard boxes down here and burn them and it was just rife with weeds. It was just a waste, a real waste of land. You know, we had this land, we weren't growing any fruit or veg ourselves, which is absolutely criminal. You know, it's, I don't know, I feel quite embarrassed that I didn't grow anything before 2020, you know? So when I get into something, I like to get in with both feet in the deep end and I uh, probably agree that that's what's gone on here. My wife wondered where I was most nights but now that she can see it really the barren fruit literally she's very pleased about this uh, and that's good because some of my madcap projects don't really get the seal of approval. This one most definitely has and by the end of summer it'll be essential for all the family. I absolutely love it. And I've just noticed behind me there, there's something that I haven't shown you yet. So before I sign off and tell you that in the next video, we're gonna be looking at the greenhouse and what's in there, I'll show you the rotating compost bin. I will be building a proper double or triple bay compost bin in the far end of the garden. But until then, I'm just experimenting with this little one. I had a spare bit of space, a spare bit of cash, it looked interesting. Seems to be working all right. Let's take a look. Okay, so this is 190 litres or thereabouts compost bin. It's mounted on like a spindle, so it will rotate when this is released. And the idea behind this is that it's away from slugs and snails 
so you don't get any pests in here it warms up quite a lot and if you rotate it regularly which I do every day or two apparently it produces very fine compost very quickly in here I've got grass clippings the remains of um, you know veg wrappers that not wrappers but <laughs> vegetable skins and ends and roots and things I've cut off and oh, all sorts there's a bit of horse muck in there there's a load of oak leaves there's actually some rotten oak uh, branches and so on and what I want to do with this compost is put something in the soil that's going to allow the mycelium that hopefully will be living in here to proliferate through the soil which, in a, which will enable hopefully the transfer of everything vitamins minerals information in the soil nutrients that sort of thing you know to make the plants grow really well in every part of the garden they seem to be doing a good job now but i'm always striving for perfection so with this you've got like a little porthole on there that you unscrew You lock that into position, you unscrew that, you fill it up with whatever you want to fill it up with, tighten that back up, give it a roll around and just let it sit there. I'll bring the camera in, let you look in there, it's developing quite nicely. So this lot's been in since the beginning of the year, I have added to it a little bit. But, oh, it's nice and warm in there as well. Worms. Look at the worms in there, man. Look at that. You know, it's warm in there, but it's definitely not too warm for the worms in there. Absolutely pounding away at that. See all the little branches in there. Hopefully they'll be broken up pretty soon. They are quite rotten, though. So they should do. And in there, we've got little arms that stick out across the central shaft oh, there's another one there's another one so as you rotate it it's mixing it up constantly now obviously you're not going to get 190 liters of compost in there because you need it to fall on itself and mix but there's a canny bit in there and as i say there's a cracking amount of worms if ever any bait fishermen wanted to go fishing all they've got to do is just ratch about in here easily find worms that's it tops on that gets released and you can hear it turning in there it's quite good exercise as well you know if you do this for five minutes every day Burn a few calories. That's it. So far, it seems to be working very well. You may have seen earlier that there's going to be a house built on the other side of this wall. That's good. The big garage off to here, and the wall has created a absolute microclimate in here the conditions are just perfect for growing it's more or less south facing it's protected on one side by trees protected on the other side by a wall and a you know a big garage which is stone built which holds the heat it's a really good place to grow vegetables and i had no idea that such a small bit of land could be so productive now in the next video we're going to be taking a look at the greenhouse and what's going on in there because it's it's like a normal greenhouse but stranger and more over engineered um, <laughs> again that's something that wasn't a cheap thing to install but it, it, it should last me out anyway it should it should last me out even if i live to be a hundred it'll probably last me out it's um it's a beast you'll see that in part five thanks for watching this one i'll see you in the next video hello there welcome to the last part 
of my what have I been doing in 2020 videos this is part five and this one is going to be showing my ridiculously over engineered greenhouse that's it behind me we've got it dark brown to match the shed that it's attached to the shed that it's attached to is the one that's got my uh, batteries in it's also going to have a chest freezer to enable me to store all of this food that's going to be coming out of this garden and it blends in really really well I'm super pleased with it it was made by a company called Secura or Secura Windows which is S-E-K-U-R-A Windows from Kingston Park in Newcastle really good company um, well, I, I don't really know what more to say about them just really good company they measured up perfectly it's not quite square which is not my fault but the guy that built the base's fault I won't name his name um, <laughs> it was structurally sound but not quite square Secura worked around that they've provided me with a absolutely cracking greenhouse obviously they didn't provide me that for free it's all double glazed it's got a double glazed roof it's a pretty expensive job but it's well worth it I'm over the moon with how it performs as well because even in the winter it was minus five outside six o'clock in the morning in here it was still warm from the day before and that's with no heating it sits on a huge concrete pad we needed to put that in as like a raft to put it on because the ground itself was built up it's we've done quite a lot of work with the digger and building and all, all sorts of stuff but uh, you know the end result is what you're seeing now I didn't bother filming all the stages of how we did it that's not really important um, the finished result and what I'm growing in here is the important thing that's really what 99% people want to see you know so I'll put the link to secure windows in the video description I would definitely recommend them they're a local company well at least they are to me as well they're about 10 mile away from me so as I said in the last video I do like to support local business wherever I can they get my vote and a shout out and a link good stuff oh before we go in there you'll see my secret weapon which is rotted horse manure <laughs> I use that in pretty much everything I mean you can see it's in the pots it's just everywhere it does a cracking job you see it all over there that's against all of the uh, tomatoes tomatoes seem to do really well growing with that on top and even in here well they are tomatoes they're touching the roof <laughs> yeah so let's have a look inside here we have a tomato pepper chili apocalypse We've got various sorts of tomatoes in here. Okay, so what's this one? Tigerella tomatoes, we've got a couple of those. Here we've got oh, green zebra tomatoes. Again, there's a couple of those plants. And here we've got San Marzano tomatoes. Again, a couple of those plants. In amongst them, we've got pots of coriander. Some of it started to go, you know, go past its best to seed. I still eat it. It still tastes absolutely lovely on a curry. The rest of the tomatoes that I grew, as shown in the previous video, are grown all the way around there. The, again, there's just a mix of the three varieties in there. I didn't bother labeling them. We'll just see what happens with them. We've got two chances. Slim and none in this wonderful northeast environment that they find themselves in. You'll probably notice that the bench hasn't actually got a top on it. Now, that was a happy accident. I built the frame thinking that I could put like you know build little drawers or shelves or something in underneath it uh, and then what I thought was if I get tr trees like this which is 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters I could sit that on top put all my seedlings and everything in there get them up to a certain size pot them on into bigger pots and then I could just slide the, th the, the tree in at a lower level and grow them up there if they get absolutely massive I could slide that down to a lower level again so it allows me to make use of this frame in numerous ways so for instance these ones I've got sitting on top if these were tomatoes I'd probably move them down to that level 
that these ones are growing in. But these are peppers. I don't think he's going to get quite as high. But you never know. The might. Tell you what, I'm just going to switch that uh, the water off in here for a second. That's better. I'll explain where that water noise was coming from in a moment. Here we have oh, all sorts of chili peppers. We've got the long bird's eye chilies. I think there's four of those plants. Here at the back we've got Satan's Kiss Chili. There's four of them, not three of them, sorry. Uh, here we've got Sweet Marconi Pepper, which is like a long sweet pepper. It's again, four of them. And here we've got four... Four unknown ones. What the heck are they? Now, are they the Reaper Chilies? I maybe should have put some labels in them ones. Marconi's. Long chilies, uh, bird's eye ones, Satan's Kiss. I think they're Reaper chilies, California Reaper chilies. We'll say they are. We'll find out soon enough. Um, we've got another one of those trays here where I pot everything up. Again, that can just be taken off and slid underneath here. And we've also got space under there for compost and so on and such forth. Here we've got six pots of. A really interesting tomato called Brad's Atomic Tomato. No, sorry, Brad's Atomic Grape Tomato. They get all sorts of really weird colours on them. They really look like they've come out of some, you know, post-apocalyptic nuclear war zone, you know. So, I, yeah, I want to see what they're like. If, if um, I'm hoping they're nice, but if Brad's Atomic Grapes aren't nice, they'll be going in Ned's Atomic Dustbin. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure they'll be alright. I love tomatoes. Uh, off from there, we've got... Oh, they're the Reaper Chilies. Reaper Chilies. What the heck were those ones then? It's four unknown chilies there. No. Uh, I cannot remember. It'll be something outrageously hot, no doubt. I'll show you these things in a second. Let's just put that on the back burner swing around to what was on the other side of the door as you come in. We've got the world's tallest tomato plants. I've already nipped the tops out of there but they're still going berserk. Uh, there's just a variety of different types in there. There's Alicante, Money Maker, Golden Sunrise or Yellow Sunrise or something. This one's a beefsteak tomato. It's just starting to get the tomatoes on. Apparently they get really huge. None of them have gone red yet but they're getting there. That's just a forest of tomatoes. God knows how many tomatoes we're gonna get off there. It's ridiculous. Just off to the side of there, we've got a little door under here. So, where are we? My shed sits up there. And under here, we've got a door which allows me to get in underneath the shed. So I just use that for storage. It's not very tall, it's only about four foot tall. So I just store old pipes and you know, fertilizer, pots and all sorts of muck in there. We've also got a door that goes in from outside as well. So if I want something in the garden, but don't want to get into here. It don't want to get into the greenhouse to let the heat out. I can get in from outside as well. So we'll utilize the space underneath the shed. Uh, it's where I keep my dwarven workforce. <laughs> right, so above there, we've well, I've made use of the space above there. I've basically just put a support up here and here, uh, a two by two frame on the top, and I can put pots of things up here. So here we've got basil, and I mean, oh, smell that beautiful, absolutely beautiful, tastes class as well. You can get addicted to smelling things in here, it's hellish. And then you can't really see because of all this growth, but we've got one, two, three pots of something called Kuka Melon, C U C A M E L O N, also known as Mouse Melon. They get little, whoa, little melon type things about that long that literally look like a melon, but they're a part of the cucumber family, and apparently it tastes like a mixture of cucumber and lime. You maybe can't see it there, but we've got one form in there. There was a tiny little yellow flower, and it's just started. Oh, there's a better one. It's just started forming the fruit. So they'll be interesting. There's a nation of them growing on there, and they're kind of getting into everything. I mean, they've started to grow into the tomatoes, and they've started to grow into this thing. 
which is my hydroponic slash aeroponic grown towers. So <laughs> I actually saw something similar to this on a no Facebook, I'm not on bloody Facebook, but what's it called? On an Instagram page and it was Pat Militich, uh, the ex uh, MMA fighter. It was on his page. He bought one, I forget what it was called, but it was only available in the US. So I actually made one pretty similar to his, just out of like ordinary shelving, like sectional shelving that you could buy off eBay. Again, I'll put a link to it in the video description. The four inch white pipes are drainage pipe. And you create holes in here to put your pots in. And then you just plant it up with whatever you want to plant it up with. These dwarf tomatoes seem to be doing really well in it. The lettuce are doing not so well. I think it's a little bit too hot in here for them, to be honest with you. In the winter, the lettuce would really grow well in here. And then down the side of here, we've got four foot daylight tubes. So each one of these stands has got two pipes. Each pipe holds 20 plants. So we've got two stands, four pipes. So there's enough room for 80 plants. Down the inside of each part of the frame, we've got a four foot uh, daylight tube, which is 6,500 K. I don't think that stands for, it might be Kelvin. 6,500, anyway, it's a bright daylight tube. They produce the equivalent of 2,200 lumens of light each. So that's blasting away, absolutely blasting away. I mean, look at that, man. The, the plants are doing really well. You know, they've got fruit on there. Flowers, well, them flowers, every one of them. Hopefully will be a tomato cascading down there. They're loving it. And this is fed from this tank. This is a 350 or 375 litre tank. It's the sort of thing you'd get uh, mobile window washers having in the back of a transit van or something, you know? Again, I'll put a link to this in the video description. I think I might have got that on eBay. It's a really substantial tank, solid. And I've got an air pump, which pumps water into here. Sorry, pumps air into here, just to keep it circulating. And in there, I've got water from the pond filters. So that's really nutritious. I did add like tomato right or something else. What was the other thing I put in there? Uh, something like a, a liquid fertilizer. God, what was it? Not grow more. Baby bio? No, it wasn't that. It was some sort of grow liquid I put in there. I don't know whether I've got the mix right, but everything seems to be doing okay. So I think I've got it more or less there. Um, and the pump, which is a 3000 liter an hour pump, pumps up a one inch pipe through a splitter, which goes up here and splits again and it feeds down one, two, three, four tops and then the water just cascades down and because of the design of this well I'll show you when the water's on it, it distributes the water all down the inside of this tube it doesn't drip at all it's not a drip lost it's really efficient system and each one of these can be regulated with a tap which I've got up there so if I didn't want this system on at all I could just shut this whole system off again the lights are on the switch as well so I can switch these lights off if I wanted nothing on this side and just it's adaptable and above here I've got some little fans that run off a USB you can just see that plant quivering in the flow of air there they were given to me by my mate Aiden he bought them for his systems said I might be able to use them and I said thank you very much they just keep things from grow going too feisty so the pump feeds up to here, we've got a, a waterproof outdoor socket, uh, it's got a built in timer as well so we can set a timer if necessary. I've just had it going 24-7, it seems to work well. If I was planting other things in here it may not need constant supply, I don't know. It, that gives me the option to alter it to whatever I need it to be. I'm still learning so I don't really know. So we'll just switch that on. 
out the water's been pumped from there. Oh, and it started coming down the insides of these tubes. Let's have a look in there. There you go. Hopefully you can see that the water is just showering down the inside of there. And this little collar here just enables the water to go around the inside of it and sheds it away from the sides. And I've sealed along the sides just with clear, not clear silicon, white silicon. So there's no chance of any water getting out of there. Yeah, I'm really pleased with that. Oh, I forgot to show you before I head off and do my summary that this oh, a forest of blooming plants here, we've got jalapenos and peppers in here. These little lights here are just like miniature grow lights. I've got those on just to give a little bit more red light. Then again, you can swap that so you only have blue lights or you can have red lights or you can have a mix of red and blue. I have got proper grow, grow lights to go down the inside of here for if I'm only growing tomatoes in here because I think they'll do better with the grow light than they would with an ordinary white daylight tube. So I have got lights to enable me to swap around. I don't know whether you can see, but they just unplug from the top and from the bottom, which will, will enable me to just set them up really quick. Uh, and this is just like a little light that you can, you can just adjust the position of. It's got four different heads on and it's got a clip on there which is just clipped onto this trellis. And I can just move that up with these plants down here, get a little bit taller and just shine it wherever I want, you know. <laughs> Again, I don't know whether that's doing any good but uh, it's there, you know. So there you go, that's my greenhouse. Hopefully you've enjoyed this last part of what I've been doing in 2020. This one isn't massive, you know, it's not a huge greenhouse, but I've tried to make it very efficient. I've tried to use all the space if I possibly can. In the winter, when all of these tomatoes and chilies and peppers and everything are finished, across the top of this bench, I'll probably build another self-watering system, except I won't have the pipes uh, vertical like that, I'll have them horizontal, I've already got all the parts for that, so it can all just be fed by the same reservoir, and we'll see what goes on there. It does have the potential to produce a nation of, well, everything, really. <laughs> Really, this, in conjunction with those two vegetable gardens, is going to produce a nation of organic, nutritious food. And to me, that's what it's all about. It's about the nutrition, because anybody can produce big food, and you see that all the time in supermarkets, but when you taste it, it's like, there's no taste. Everything so far that we've had out of the garden, which isn't much, because it's going to come to fruition this year, Everything we've had has tasted absolutely amazing. It's just been nice. None of it has seen any tap water. So it's got no fluoride, no chlorine, none of that sort of chemical crap that you get in that you know bleaches the soil and kills all the biome and virome in the soil. The soil is just fed with nutrition. It's just allowed to live, you know, and that reflects in what's produced in the soil or in the water. It's uh, it's going well. I'll go outside. This is noisy. So that's what I've been doing in 2020 and in 2021. Hopefully a lot of you people watching this have been doing the same. We're gonna need to grow our own fruit and veg and moving forward into the new normal, the skills we learn are really gonna be the new currency. The more skills we can learn, the better off we're going to be. I kind of, I want to, I don't know, I just want to learn. I want to, everything I get into, I want to get into 100% and learn as much as I can. Hopefully, I don't think you'll have learned anything from this video, but hopefully you've enjoyed seeing what I've been doing. In subsequent videos, I will be doing bits and bobs, just showing you how I pot things up, how I 
just basically what I do on a day to day basis down here and I'm no teacher as far as the vegetables go but you might learn something in subsequent videos thanks very much for watching if you've watched every part of the series thank you doubly or triply uh, and I'll see you in the next video don't know when that'll be don't know what it'll be on but I look forward to seeing you thanks for watching